This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in everyone to this week's edition of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Adam the Jock Straczynski. On today's show, a new ESPN voice on WWE, Finn Balor spills the beans on his contract and creative, and a lot of news around the wrestling world regarding a wrestler who was recently part of CMLL and New Japan, appeared on AEW, but abruptly signed with the competition and AEW has more changes on their roster. Of course, we got to break down this Money in the Bank pay-per-view that we just had last week, taking a look at the wonderful world of wrestling and help me do it all, sort it all out, make sense of all of it. He is the one who has the cleanest of assholes. He is the one who just got his recent colonoscopy. He is the doc, John Macroom. Because before we start, we don't usually share a lot of personal news on this podcast. We have another one that we we tend to break away from the sports and we kind of talk a little bit more about our personal lives. We don't usually do that here. But you recently got done with your, I don't know, is it annual, biannual? Is it every couple of years you get it done? Colonoscopy. And uh, it turns out you are the brightest and best in your class as everything came back good. So congratulations to you. But Kind of walk us through this process. I know it is it is tough. You have to usually be near a toilet for at least 24 hours, and then they put you under, and then you're back out in 10 minutes, and, and everything is good. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's crazy. You look at it. It's it's just once. If you're, if you're clean and no polyps on your first yep. time doing it at 45, I don't have to do it again for 10 years. And, boy, I'm already thinking, okay. I'm already thinking about it the next 10 years because um, you, you, you have to go on a liquid diet, 24 hours before, and then nothing in your mouth the day of the procedure. And so I typically I uh, eat breakfast early because I get up early. And it was crazy because, of course, the day before I wake up, I'm super hungry. So I'm just chugging this uh, chicken broth, the Jello, uh, as much water as humanly possible. And then when the prep starts, it's absolutely true. It's it's challenging. It's tough, but it's not horrible. I mean, the hunger pain, you just mentally, you just have to kind of bear through it. But then once, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the, the first go around, you understand because you're just cleaning out your original system. Then you got to drink a whole, bo- a whole bottle of laxative at 6 p.m. and midnight. And the midnight one is awful because you're just like already drained. And then it just comes at like two o'clock in the morning. It was like, boom, spent another half hour in there. And it, you're, it's just liquid. It's just pure liquid coming out. And it's an unusual feeling. But once you get through it, once you're cleaned out, you're, you feel the lightest you've ever felt. You feel great. You're like, oh, there's nothing literally in my system. So you get there. The toughest part really for me, I'm tough. I'm a tough individual. I can handle a lot of things. I have the tools to cope. The toughest thing that happens to me in all these medical appointments is you get in, you get checked in, they give you the attention right away, and then they sit you in a room by yourself for 45 minutes where nobody comes and talks to you. You're just alone with your thoughts. And then all, of course, the first five minutes, 10 minutes, you're like, okay, this is going to be great. And then every single thought imaginable comes in. What if it's bad? What if this? What if uh, it's colon cancer? Da, da, da. Every single imaginable thought will come in your head. Just try and sit there for 45 minutes and not think of anything. So then you're just like, no, God, it's going to be good. You're healthy. You have no symptoms. You're absolutely fine. They're going to come back. Or you think of, what if he pokes me in the abdomen? What if I uh, have to go to emergency? What if something bad happens in a procedure? What if this? What if you don't wake up? What if da, 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 da? And you're just like, oh, my God, the mental torture. Once they wheel you back there, they're like, you did the hard part. Uh, you, you did the prep. All right, good night. And you're just out within four seconds. And then you wake up. You're just like, okay. So it's uh, you get wheeled into a cold room, ice cold. And they talk to you for a minute. They say, okay, we're going to do this procedure. We'll give you the results. And then you're out. So it's just the waiting. And that's what my primary does to me. And now this happened. So it's a good mental test of just being positive and just saying, you know, eventually after all those thoughts run through your head, you just say, you know, just go through what you do. And I said, God, protect me. I know you will. Look out for me and uh, make sure all this is good. And of course it's good. I'm healthy. I am a healthy 45-year-old man. Just got to lose weight. 
listen, I have no symptoms. I work two jobs. I love what I do. I wake up early every day, full of energy, full of zest. I push myself to do everything. I push myself to deal with all the things in my life I don't want to deal with. And I just go through and I'm happy. And that's the best way to be is that there is a pathway to be happy and you just got to get after it. And this is part of my happiness. I look forward to it. I look forward to uh, what I was thinking in there is I can't wait to talk to Adam again on the next podcast. We're going to do this for 30, 40 years. I don't care how long it takes. We're never stopping it. But cuz, could you imagine if today, after all that preparation, all that medical procedure, I said three, two, one and didn't hit record? Luckily, I just reflect on the fact that throughout 10, 11 years of podcasting, multiple recordings, we've never really had a major botch where you could say, oh my God, John, we talked for an hour and we didn't record it. Now we've had some audio (laughs) issues. We've had some situations in which we've, uh, you know, talked and some, some good parts get cut out because of internet dropping, but I have never once not hit record on this podcast. How does an individual in a professional wrestling match, one, two, three, and you're supposed to win, not kick out. I can understand Damian Priest maybe got his bell rung, but I thought that money in the bank as a totality was ruined because the business was exposed. Wow. I was disappointed. I, I, I was like, man, it's, it's also not just because of this one isolated incident, but now in totality, you can't have your champion have back-to-back major flubs in key matches. It sucked. It, it was like, uh, Damian Priest didn't kick out, and everybody's left scrambling, and the official looks stupid, the company looks stupid, and I was just like, ah. Oh. And that was on the heels of some botches in the women's match. Uh, you, you just say, okay, uh, we always talk about it as a, as a fair standard, AEW got into a rut with botches, Damian Priest, and Triple H said it, he said, hey, you guys uh, are going to talk about it, yeah, because a a, a non-pin that happens right before our eyes, how much did that fuck up the pay-per-view in your mind, in totality? Not so much for me, look, it, it wasn't great, right, and it was blatant, but it didn't really ruin it. I, I'm su- I'm surprised that it really ruined the pay-per-view as much as it did for you. And, and you're right. When you say that the, the guy who is carrying the crown for your company has now had back-to-back flubs in two pay-per-views, in two high-profiled matches, you can't really have that. You can't really be doing that. If you're going to be the guy who's going to put the company on his back and help carry it, you got to be better. And look, the first one we kind of explained away. We're like, okay, it was uh, cash at the castle. Cash at the castle. Uh, there were multiple issues with the ropes. The ropes didn't seem to be as tight as they normally were, and that was part of the reason why he caught his foot. We were able to explain it away, and he was in there with a veteran like Drew McIntyre who really picked up the pieces and really made uh, chicken salad out of what could have been chicken shit. And they were able to work through it and work around it. Those things happen. This one right here, I find it a little bit harder to explain away. I, I don't know if he got his bell rung. I don't know if you can say that. I don't know if he just maybe lost track, if he lost count, if he just wasn't paying attention. I, I you know, it, it does put everybody in the ring in a bad spot because you have all of this creative that you've got planned. And now everybody's got to pivot quickly. And you're right. The ref looks silly because he has to hold hold his count. And that's not what that's supposed to be. Seth Rollins is kind of like, what are you doing, bro? And like now Seth Rollins has to pivot. Drew McIntyre is like, is he going to kick out? What's going on? We've got we've got another 15 minutes worth of show to go for just this one match. And this guy could blow it all. Luckily, they were able to work through it. You're right. It was a highlight of the night, or maybe I should say a low light of the night. Everybody knew. Everybody knew. I think there was an audible groan across the crowd when when Damian Priest did not kick out and the referee had to pull his count. Uh, but for me, that didn't really ruin the pay per view at all. I thought this. I thought overall this was a fun pay per view. I thought this was really good. I thought this was an interesting pay per view. This again, this isn't one of the big ones. This is this is. I won't say this is a, a, a B-level pay-per-view because this one has worked its way up the up the totem pole. I would say this is definitely a, a, a B-plus, A-minus pay-per-view. 
Um, one of those pay-per-views where, you know, it's like I said, it's not one of the big four. It's not WrestleMania. It's not the Royal Rumble. But it is it is right after that in that tier. This is like that second tier of pay-per-views in my in my opinion. I think it's been one of the ones that have given us really big moments. And this pay-per-view absolutely gave us big moments and really, to me, felt like it helped hit the reset button on some of these stories or help bring some of these stories that we've been kind of working towards, help bring them into a little bit more focus. And it all kind of kicked off with Drew McIntyre winning the men's Money in the Bank match. I thought this was a hard-hitting match. I thought this was a lot of fun. I thought a lot of guys looked really, really good. Specifically, LA Knight, I thought he looked really good in this match. I thought Jey Uso looked really good in this match. Was it the right call for Drew to win this uh, briefcase? And then basically look in the camera and it's like, I'm cashing this in. Just wait. You're, I'm, I'm coming. And you kind of knew that this was happening. Uh, it, it, in, in our group match, Kenny was like, before, before anything even got announced, he was like, men's money in the bank is kicking this off. This was like 20 minutes before the pay-per-view even started. And he was like, I'm calling shenanigans right now. So like, you already knew that stuff was afoot. Drew ends up winning it. Was that the best call to put the put the briefcase in his hand? Well, obviously, because I didn't pick him to win. I, I thought it was horrible because you look at it and you say, I understand that, you know, Drew McIntyre has had multiple opportunities to win the world title and he hasn't gotten it back. But I just felt like the, the real nature of Money in the Bank is the intrigue, is the when who's going to cash it in and stuff like that. And yeah, I get the idea of sometimes you tell people what's coming and then it comes. But I just thought that Jey Uso would have been a perfect candidate. I thought LA Knight would have been a perfect candidate. The money in the bank is really not for made guys. It's not for guys. And I get the idea of uh, the opportunity to use the title as a way to further the CM Punk story of what is CM Punk willing to do to screw Drew McIntyre. But I don't need that. It's been done already. CM Punk has screwed Drew McIntyre multiple times. It has been seared in my brain. I don't need more multiple layers. It's like sometimes they just overcook it, like they keep hammering the same point home. Yes, a certain portion of your fans have ADD, and they keep forgetting, but a lot of us don't. Like, we understand. The 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 story between CM Punk and Drew McIntyre is Drew pissed off CM Punk by highlighting his injury and laughing at him, and CM Punk is on a revenge tour. It's not that difficult. You don't have to keep reminding me that CM Punk screws Drew McIntyre over and over and over and over again. Now it's to the point, it's the law of diminishing return. It's annoying. So to me, I was like, okay, Drew wins it. Then you realize what happens later. And again, because of the botch, it screws up because I thought it would have been a nice pivot. Before we get into it, I would say this. If you're now a head booker, and a botch like that happens, would you have wanted the referee just to count to three and give Seth the title and we just work around it? You have Seth just say, look, guys, if there's a botch one, two, three, and somebody wins it they're not supposed to, and it's a title, we'll figure it out. Because all you could do then is just two weeks later, you have another match and Drew and Damian wins it. You recognize that the botch, you know, puts together a quick title run, but it's happened before. You've had title runs last a day. You've had title runs where some like uh, Drew McIntyre, where he wins a title and then two minutes later, he loses it. As a booker, if you're the head guy, I would say, fuck it. Yeah, that would have been kind of intriguing. That would have got people talking. Was that a botch? Was that supposed to happen that way? Uh, you could have had Damien. You could have even threw it out there that, you know, Triple H could have skewed reality a little bit. He said, said, well, maybe some things happened in that match that weren't supposed to happen. But, uh, you know, I just thought that the, the worst option happened and they went with it, which is to, uh, the referee should never stop counting because you exposed the, the part of the, you, I, of course, WWE is crushing the storytelling, but you also have to mix it. It's 50% storytelling and 50% wrestling and not exposing that it's fake. And you can't do that. And uh, sometimes th that happens because of injuries and real life swerves that do end up happening because of the physical nature of the job. But that was rough. Would you have wanted Seth to win it? If, if you're like, fuck it, it happened. People saw it. Would you have wanted the ref to keep counting one, two, three? I think in a normal match, yes. I think in this match, because you had those additional stipulations that didn't need to be there, yeah. the ones regarding Damian Priest leaving the Judgment Day and the ones regarding Seth Rollins not challenging for a championship as long as Damian Priest holds the belt, I think because you had those additional stipulations, I think that's where things get a little bit murky. And I think that's where you, you kind of have to stick to the original plan because 
if now you're kicking Damian Priest out of the Judgment Day, it really impacts what you've got laid out for for when Rhea Ripley returns. It really impacts different parts of different stories. The, the thing is, Damian Priest and Seth Rollins and Drew McIntyre, all three of these guys are cogs in, in, in one massive story, right? And these stories have different parts to them, but they're all these main cogs in them. So Damian Priest is this cog, not just in this match with Seth Rollins and Drew McIntyre interfering. Damian Priest also has a little bit of history with Drew because of what took place uh, when when Drew cashed in or when uh, when Damian Priest cashed in on Drew. And that ties into what CM that ties into CM Punk. Damian Priest also has stuff going on in Judgment Day. You've got this whole story arc going on with Lib. You've got this whole story arc going on when when is Rhea coming back? You've got this whole story arc going on with Dominic and all of that going on. And then Seth Rollins is here. He's kind of caught in the middle. He's got the stuff going on with Damian Priest. He now has this interest with Drew McIntyre because these two uh, guys fought at um, uh, what was it? Was it? It was WrestleMania. So these guys fought fought at WrestleMania and. Uh, Seth ends up losing to Drew, so there's a little bit of of history there. There, Seth also has issues with CM Punk, so you're rolling Seth into CM Punk right now, and then you've got Drew with his interest with CM Punk, and you've got this whole thing with CM Punk going on on this other side. So I think because you put these additional stipulations, you added all of this weirdness to this match that didn't have to be there. I think that's why you have to follow what you initially laid out. Because if you start changing these things, you end up having to retcon everything. And it becomes, and wrestling fans do not like that. Wrestling fans get very upset when you start doing those things. We start telling us that, that what you did here didn't matter. And what the stipulation you put on here wasn't really real. And it wasn't real. It wasn't true. Well, why did you do it? Why did you have us buying it? And why did you have us believing it just to undermine it? A week later, and we're going to talk about that later on in this show because there was some stuff that took place on Monday night between Damian Priest and Seth Rollins that really irked me. So, leading right into into that type of thing, you you just you can't do that. It becomes messy and it looks stupid, and it really devalues what you just did, devalues the story that you just built, and it devalues the 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 previous week's work. So that's why I think you had to do it. But normally, I'm I'm right there in lockstep with you. If the guy doesn't kick out or the guy's not answering the call, it's one, two, three. What happens, happens. It's how it is. But I think in this specific case, there's too many stories that are wrapped up. There's too much tied up. There's too much going on. You knew that you had Drew coming down to that Damian Priest-Seth Rollins match later on. You knew that CM Punk was going to get involved in that match. You knew that there was all these other things going on. And I think the thing is... You're trying to, I think, get Drew away for a little bit. And it's going to be interesting because they're supposed to be bringing him back this Monday. So the way I was looking at it was you're going to have Damian Priest beat, beat Seth Rollins and Drew McIntyre because Drew comes down to cash in incredibly early. And it might have been smart, might have been dumb, might have been a waste, might have been whatever, whatever we want to talk about with it. It could have been all of those things. But CM Punk's going to get involved. And CM Punk does get involved, costs Drew his opportunity, ends up costing Seth an opportunity. Damien retains. So I think what that does is that now sets up your story with Judgment Day, and Damien's fine with Judgment Day, and can go about doing things with Judgment Day. At some point, Judgment Day is breaking up. And it might be because of this specific situation here with Damien Priest and what he ends up doing after this match and what he ends up doing with Rhea Ripley after this match and how it impacts Dominic. That could be part of the reason why Judgment Day breaks up. It could be the whole thing with him and Finn Balor, because him and Finn Balor have seemed to be at odds lately. So there's all this going on over there. You can now take all of this, put this in a box, and we're going to set this on the side, and that's going to become its own story. You've now removed Damian Priest from the equation, which is fine. But now you have Seth Rollins and Drew McIntyre. Drew McIntyre gets himself suspended because he beats up two referees and he elbows Adam Pierce in the mouth after Money in the Bank when they're getting ready to throw it to the... Uh, to the press conference. So that's a great way to write Drew McIntyre off of television for a couple of weeks, which would then give us Seth Rollins and CM Punk. And you can let these two have their small feud. Because if you remember the initial feud, when CM Punk came back, it seemed like it was going to be Seth Rollins. And it seemed like it was going to be CM Punk. And we never got that because uh, CM Punk ends up getting injured. They have to pivot and they go with this whole Drew McIntyre storyline. 
Well, this would allow you to get that story, that mini story, and all that history that they have. Because remember, when Seth Rollins was coming up in NXT, CM Punk was the guy who wanted him as part of the Shield. The original Shield idea, if you listen to CM Punk, was his. And Seth Rollins was the guy, was one of the guys that he wanted. He wanted Seth Rollins and he wanted uh, Dean Ambrose as those guys. And the other guy was, uh, oh, was, was, was uh, Ono. Uh, I can't remember his first name. Anyways, uh, Cassius Ono, that's who it was, uh, wanted him. and said they went with Roman Reigns because they thought Roman Reigns uh, was going to be the guy. Turns out Roman Reigns is the guy. Seth Rollins was also the guy. Dean Ambrose for a minute was a guy. Uh, he's now the guy over in AEW. So not a bad job identifying talent by CM Punk there. But they ended up going in a completely different direction with what they wanted to do with the Shield. But you have a history there that you can lean into. You can remove Drew from the equation for now, and you can have Drew kind of coming back and just kind of disturbing the peace with CM Punk here and there. But you can have these two guys have their story, get done with that, move on to the Drew and CM Punk story. That's why I think you had to do it this way because there's so much that was wrapped up in this one match. And when you really start to kind of unroll it all, just making one decision and deviating from the plan – could have that ripple effect where it really damages the storytelling. And that's why I think you had to do what you had to do there. Normally, I agree with you 100%, John. I, I think it's if you don't kick out, you don't do your job, it's one, two, three, and you lose. And that's just the way it's got to be. Uh, in this specific case, I think it needed to be this way. I think it had to go this way. Yeah, it's uh, def- definitely uh, something that's sparked a firestorm online. Lots of different debates. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. Damian Priest now really has to make up for it, and we'll talk about it maybe just before uh, we talk about AEW. But in the end, you know what? If if this just ends up being Damian Priest being fed to Gunther, we might have to talk about this being probably one of the worst title runs mm-hmm. initially for somebody in the company, and that's where I think this is headed. And it was good. Look, Triple H did a great job to protect his wrestler. And he said, look, Damian Priest had a great performance. And it was a good match outside of that. And Seth Rollins lived up to his end of the billing. I loved the way you wrapped it up. And look, those those two situations obviously were key, integral. I just would have liked to have seen something different. I thought Jey Uso and LA Knight deserved, I thought at that point, the money in the bank. I don't believe, I don't like fast cash-ins, but I get it in regards to the story that they're currently telling that Drew and the title at this point in time don't necessarily have to be relevant for uh, for Drew McIntyre to hold it and, and wait another year. But the women, I thought, also lived up to it. And and despite the fact that neither, I think, Money in the Banks went over 25 minutes, I thought both did great. And uh, look, Tiff Time is legit. She deserved to win. I thought the match was great. Of course, the botch that you saw with the rope jump and that, that, that didn't succeed. But you look at it and you say, the women did, uh, look, Chelsea Green, my goodness, kudos to you. She was great. I think she I won the hearts of everybody, yes. Yes, but... I, I think going into this match, so going into this match, uh, in, into the Women's Money in the Bank match, which was the, you want to call it the co-main event, that match, Chelsea Green going into it, I was already rooting for her. And I and I watched, she was, she was the one who I really wanted to win. I ended up picking, picking uh, Tiffany Stratton to win, but she was the one who I wanted to win. I think she helped elevate herself and get herself so much more over in this match. She might not have won, but I think she was the one out of everybody who really got over in this match. I thought she was incredible in it. Yeah, no doubt. And you look at it and you say for Chelsea Green, she did it at TNA. Now she takes another risky bump. And the more you watch it, the more crazier it looks like. And she's willing. She's a gamer. And I think that she's going to be continued to, to get over and do her thing. And she's going to be, you know, organically somebody that's been put through the ringer with different characters, but will come out on top and will get herself over through sheer will. And when you take crazy bumps, it literally, you could argue, was the moment of the night and was something that will be replayed from this money in the bank for a long, long time. It's a great spot. It's crazy. Uh, you try to picture yourself trying to do it, and there's so many things that could go wrong. Uh, the ladder doesn't go right. You, you don't time it right. You, you hit the ropes instead of the, the tables. Man, she's done it now twice. Okay, kudos to you, man. You're a gamer, and you, you, you've sacrificed your body. Now do something with your story, and hopefully the WWE rewards her with opportunities moving forward. For sure. 
Uh, after the men's Money in the Bank, we had Sami Zayn defeating Braun Breaker uh, for the WWE Intercontinental title. Real quick, just low key, has this been an impressive title run by Sami? I, I feel like I didn't give this much thought, but this guy has defeated Gunther for the belt, and now he's just beaten Braun Breaker. And, and Braun Breaker, both these guys, just massive, angry individuals who could just snap you like a twig. And it's kind of the story with Sami Zayn, right? Consummate underdog, always kind of fending off, fending off, fending off, getting ran through the ringer, and somehow manages the win. Low key, like I said, has this been impressive? No doubt. I think that uh, kudos to WWE for putting talented individuals that have been climbing the ladder in front of them. And yeah, absolutely. I think that this is worthy of what Sami Zayn deserves. And quick side note, he shares the same birthday. El Generico say, shares the same birthday as my daughter. She was she got a kick out of it. Uh, my youngest, who turned 10, she was like, really? And uh, I was like, oh, that's really cool. A lot of intertwining birthdays that I can that can set my memory uh, in regards to birthdays. And it's real it's real cool that uh, Sami Zayn, who has been really appreciated and been part of some great memories as of late, can do some things with the title. And I think that his character development, clearly Triple H is right. He's a star. He's been doing things, and you don't have to even mention it. He's a superstar, and the things that he's involved in, he is the definition of an intercontinental champion. But the question probably will be asked in a couple of weeks. Maybe we'll debate it in, 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 in if there's low-key times. Could you picture Sami Zayn being the world champion, uh, uh, taking it from Gunther? Maybe that'll be a nice feud that you can set up after Gunther wins is a nice series of matches with Sami Zayn. And maybe the guy that takes it off of Sami Zayn, if he's patient, and uh, that takes it off of Gunther after uh, a nice run is Sami Zayn. I think, I think that probably would make sense. And a lot of people would get behind it. A great feel-good moment, uh, maybe in Canada, where Gunther has the, the title, uh, maybe next year's SummerSlam, as soon as that, uh, you know, headlining night one or... or uh, prominently in night two. Yeah, Sami Zayn is legit, and I could picture it. I'm starting to now see believability that that world title is perfect because, you know, clearly the moneymaker is going to be Cody and Solo and Roman Reigns and Randy and the big boys, but that world title can also be that uh, that wrestler's belt, and uh, that's why Damian Priest having it right now kind of sucks because he, he ain't wrestling right. <laughs> um, but, Seth, but Seth Rollins is the first guy to put it on the mantle. Gunther clearly will be the destroyer. And Sami Zayn could also, with great matches, with the up-and-comers with Braun Breaker in a couple years, with uh, Dragunov, with Carmelo, with Trick Williams who will be there, with maybe Ethan Page. The, the opportunities are limitless in a couple years. I'm getting excited now talking about it. Yeah, there's a lot that can be done. And like you said, Sami Zayn is a, a consummate professional, a wrestler's wrestler, and doing a great job with that intercontinental belt about that. Gunther did a really good job to bring back to prominence. And it's a belt that sometimes gets lost in the sauce with, with everything else going on in the world of wrestling, especially in the world of WWE. Coming off of this match, we had John Cena's announcement of his retirement in 2025. I, I want to get your thoughts on this. This was unexpected. Um, I, I know that he has talked about retiring in the past. I know that he has talked about hanging him up after he got to a certain age. I was not anticipating this. And I thought this was, I thought this was done well. I thought this was as, as abrupt as it seemed. John Cena does a great job of delivering and delivering the emotion of whatever the moment is. I thought this was great. I thought his post-show press conference was was good. Obviously, did not want to talk about anything regarding Vince McMahon. Um, I get it. Uh, I didn't necessarily like the way he fielded the question, but that's here nor there. I think he is a consummate pro. He's a pro's pro. He is a guy who has been the face of WWE, is the face of WWE. He is the guy who kind of set it up for, for a guy like Seth Rollins to come in and be like, this is our house. You have to take care of our house and you have to put this company on your back and shoulder this and be this guy, be this face. Um, I think John Cena has done a, a fantastic job doing that for over two decades and him announcing his retirement and his retirement tour. I think this is going to be interesting for 2025. And I wanted to get your sense of, 
of the way it was conveyed, the way the message was conveyed, what you took out of the the post show presser, and and what do you think this this means for 2025? Oh, it means I'm excited. 30 to 40 dates. Hopefully, one more run in Detroit. Uh, is it another match with CM Punk, AJ Styles? Who's going to be the final match? Does he win the 17th? Does he win Royal Rumble? The tour is going to be legit. So I'm super excited in regards to what John Cena said. I have no problem with him punting because his answer was, I've already addressed it. It's probably not something I'm going to repeat over and over again. And he's like, you can find it. It's a simple answer, which is, hey, uh, he gave it on Howard Stern. It was elaborate. He spent like two hours. I, I think I was driving home from a trip back in February when I listened to the whole thing, and it was spectacular. He said, um, look, you know, it's it's something you have to wrestle with, somebody that was big a big part of your life. Clearly, it's 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 a huge allegation. If it's true, it's, it's deplorable. But at the same token, uh, I've checked in with Vince, and you have to hear both sides. And he took the diplomatic approach, and it, it's he gave a real honest human answer to Howard Stern, which is, yeah, it sucks that this is where somebody that you care about is. It's deplorable. And anybody that does anything like that, if it's proven to be true, has to face the wrath of the consequences of your actions. And he's like, uh, clearly, I'm not going to be, uh, he's like, there's certain things that he said it so eloquently. He's like, clearly, there are some things you could ask about that you kind of know the answer to that if, if somebody does something deplorable to somebody else, how am I supposed to feel? You think I'm going to be like, yeah, congratulations. You're an at, you're an ass hat. You know, he's like, no, if, if this is true, it's deplorable. But at the same token, uh, there is a real life situation in which this guy helped me feed my family. He helped me get to where I need to go. We have a, 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 a personal relationship. So it's just the it's, it's just the way it is. And if that's not something that you're going to rehash publicly over and over again, he, he was great. He's like, ask me whatever you want. They asked it. He answered it. That's the way it's supposed to go. And I thought he handled it professionally. All he did was spark uh, curiosity in the company. And that's all you can ask for for his final run. And John Cena is worthy of doing whatever the hell he wants. If he, He's probably going to do right by the company. He's going to lose a lot mm -hmm. uh, at the end. But I think that he probably, the question mark that everyone's going to ask is, should he hold the title for the 17th time? Then my answer is yes. And uh, Me too. he's got to do it. And however you work it out, um, it's crazy. I don't think he's going to beat Cody Rhodes. Um, I, I think the angle should be more on Raw and the world title, but does he fight Gunther? I mean, it's not really believable, so it's kind of tough, but uh, I think we believe the answer is yes. I think it's going to work up to that, and because you clearly see Rock is going to be feuding with uh, uh, Roman Reigns, but Cody Rhodes, John Cena, I mean, that could sell some tickets. That could be intriguing uh, if you can make it believable that John could win it, but I, I don't know. It's tough. Uh, you know, he beats LA Knight, beats Randy Orton, beats, you know, some of the young guys, gets up there, wins the Royal Rumble, challenges, uh, Cody Rhodes, you tell a nice story and then Cody wins it and you, and you move on. And then you, you do some of the, uh, I think it culminates at WrestleMania and then it kind of fades down into just like, you know, non-story related matches, Sami Zayn, AJ Styles, uh, CM Punk, and then you finish against whoever you think is the best for him, and we'll we'll think about that. Maybe it's The Rock, uh, maybe it's somebody else in terms of who he, who he should face to to end it all. But what we have a whole year to talk about it, man, and it's great for John Cena. Hopefully, he stays healthy so that it plays out because the man's older. But it's a beautiful story and one in which kicking off. I mean, I guess we probably know you kick off Monday Night Raw on Netflix and you just give the mic to John Cena and let him cuss the shit out of everybody in the company and let yes. him tell a promo uh, in, in Netflix's style. Oh my goodness. It's it's going to be fun when the John Cena 2025 tour kicks off. It's, it's just exciting. There's nothing else. It's so intriguing because of all the possibilities. It could go left. It could go right. Twist circles. You could finish up so many stories. Um, a lot of dream matches you could have. And it's just going to be great to, to recognize what John Cena did for the company. And I love the fact he said, look, one year of wrestling, I'm done. I'm not coming back. I'm not going to be no gimmick referee. Uh, one year and I'm done. And it's a perfect end to his career. It'll be perfect if he stays healthy. Yeah, and I think the thing that I took out of them was most interesting is it sounds like even though he retires and he's going to do it the right way, he's not going to go away and then come back. He is still going to be an ambassador for the company. He's still going to do stuff within the company. And that was the one thing I took out of it. Like, he's going to go away as a wrestler. 
guys still going to be doing things, still going to be a part of the company, which I think is important. Um, after that, we ended up getting the the Damian Priest, Seth Rollins, and then eventually Drew McIntyre match where Damian Priest retained. Uh, we then had the women's uh, Money in the Bank match where Tiffany Stratton won. Uh, I think Chelsea Green, I think we both agree, Chelsea Green was probably the highlight of that match. And then we got to our main event where the Bloodline ended up beating Cody Rhodes, uh, Randy Orton and Kevin Owens solo ends up pinning Cody Rhodes. I think we all understood the purpose of this. This helped set up uh, what was confirmed on Friday night on SmackDown. Uh, you are going to have solo and Cody challenging for that championship. Uh, so th- this, this was kind of the thing that, that laid that foundation to allow solo to go and say, I want my shot at that belt. I beat you. I was the one that pinned you. Uh, Give me my shot. How do you think this this specific match was executed? Do you think it was done well? Do you think that uh, the guys in the bloodline came out looking stronger? I know that that we had laughs and we had jokes about uh, – Tungaloa again botching an, another spot. He basically punched Kevin Owens in the butt, and then he punched his brother in the head uh, when he went for the nut shots. Um, that is, you want to talk about back to back botches? Um, that was literally back to back, and that is compounding other botches that have been made. Um, but do the bloodline look incredibly strong coming out of this match? Uh, yeah. Uh, clearly, because that's what you need to do. You need to establish them as individuals that are legit threats. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> Tunga Loa, I thought the meme of the century was now, I don't know if you've even been seeing it, people are clipping Triple H, you know, doing the come here thing in, in Gorilla, and they're putting it at different spots, and somebody clipped it, and it had Triple H waving with the AEW background, and it said, Tunga Loa, welcome, and it has Triple H pointing to the AEW sign. I thought it was great, but... But cause that one's a little bit more believable because he got pushed into the ring announce table and it looked like he might have been a little bit off with his equilibrium. Yeah, he looked like he bumped his head hard. When he when he landed and hit his head, I was like, Oh shit. There needs to be a doctor checking on him. Yeah, exactly. But you heard it. Exactly, but seeing the, I mean, the, the internet wrestling community is fucking hilarious. Seeing him, I don't know, you always nowadays have a hard time believing shit, but seeing him punch his brother in the head from that different angle was fucking hilarious. I watched it a couple times, but uh, in the end, you got the message. Solo is leading this new version of the Bloodline, and you're telling the story of uh, Solo now mentioning Roman by name. Uh, he said it on SmackDown. Hey, if Roman comes back, he has to acknowledge me. And uh, it's great. I, I, I like this new version. It's not as strong currently as Roman's at the Zenith, but boy, it looks pretty good. Uh, they're, they're, they're nasty. And I think that when you look at everything that's going on, you recognize, holy cow, you have a nasty group that is not willing to, you know, fall apart that just wants to take it and it's great it's, it's a story of hey solo step back and learn from the mistakes he was the enforcer now he's the boss and let's see what happens it's exciting it's intriguing i'm all about it i've said this numerous times this storyline to me is absolutely fantastic because it is a mafia storyline when you really boil it down you really break it down you had the guy who was was the head of of whatever crime family, whatever mob family it was, he has to go away for a while. Who rises up? In this case, it's usually, and usually, it's the guy who is his right-hand man, the guy who strong arms everything because he is the most intimidating. Everybody fears him, so everybody cowers to him and backs down and allows him to do what he wants to do. And that is exactly what, what you've got Solo doing here. He was the right-hand man. He was the guy who was the aggressor. He was the guy who was the most violent. He was the guy who was uh, intimidating everybody. And he's gone off and he's branched off and started his own, his own family, his own, uh, his own table, if you will. And all of these guys involved in this are just as crazy, just as violent, just as, as aggressive as he is, if not more. And so it's more ruthless 
and I love the, the 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 dichotomy of the two when you have um, Roman Reigns running it. It seems a little bit more cerebral. It seems a little bit more, I want to say, cool. A little bit more laid back. When Solo's running it, it is aggressive. It is high energy. It seems like it's a tea kettle ready to boil and blow. Uh, so it's just it's different and it's great and I love it and I can't wait. I'm assuming we're going to get Survivor Series. I feel like we're all waiting for this to be announced. So whenever we get it, it's going to be fantastic. But I'm I'm loving what they're doing with the Bloodline. I think this is really really good. Uh, I'm calling the card. I take the point over you. Um, I got one more right than you did. Uh, I extend my lead. It's now three points. Let's jump into we, we spent a lot of time talking WWE th- so far. Let's jump into to what took place on uh, Monday night and what really bothered me with what we had going on with Damian Priest and Seth Rollins. I kind of foreshadowed it a little bit earlier, but I want to get your sense because for me, like I said, you just undid weeks of storytelling. You you basically killed everything that you had built up for. And and it just it does it serves no purpose to do something like this. But on Monday Night Raw, Seth Rollins meets Damian Priest in the back. Uh, Damian Priest is with the with the Judgment Day. Judgment Day ends up dispersing, and it's just Seth Rollins and Damian Priest talking. And in the course of them having a conversation, basically Seth says, "Look, I appreciate you not allowing them to get involved." And you kept your word because you kept your word. I'm going to keep my word and I won't ever challenge you as long as you hold that title. Now, as they're getting ready to leave, Damian Priest says, look, once I finish with Gunther, he's like, I still need to challenge myself and I need to still go against the best of the best. And you're the best. I don't care. You can challenge me whenever you want. For me, this just undid us adding that stupid stupid little caveat to this match that it, all of a sudden everything that we had done for, for the last two weeks is totally not important because you just went and undid it. And the best up thing is that was Damian priest stipulation. So like you're down telling us that your stipulation was stupid uh, to me. It just does. It does the characters no good. And it's storytelling wise. It just shits all over it. And, and here's the thing. You're not just building the story with Damian Priest and Seth Rollins anymore. You've got CM Punk worked into this. You've got CM Punk versus Seth. You've got Seth versus Priest. And then you've got Seth versus the World Championship. And those are all the dynamics that are wrapped up in this one little story, in this little nutshell. And by saying, you can challenge me whenever, as soon as I get done with Gunther, all it does is it just kind of washes all that away and takes away the importance of everything. Did this bother you as much as it bothered me? Because I was like, this is just stupid. Like I stood up and I was like, that's just dumb. And I was pissed. And I walked to my kitchen and then I sat there, grabbed the glass of water and I just shook my head. And I was like, this is stupid storytelling. Did it bother you at all? Or did, did was it just kind of whatever to you? Yeah, no, it, it, look, they had to kind of explain away some things and I understand how it went. Uh, again, part of the reason for the botch is now you have to kind of explain what the stipulation now means for Seth Rollins because he did get screwed in the match. So, yeah, it, it's annoying. But unfortunately, when you have something like that creatively, you just kind of have to do some explaining. And that's kind of the part of wrestling we don't like is the over explanation, the undoing of stories that were pretty intriguing. But that's what they did. It didn't bother me as much. I just thought that it, they had to kind of get to the next phase of, OK, well, we have some questions now we have answered. And this is kind of the over analysis part of wrestling that you and I don't really care for. But you have to kind of tie, tie up some loose strings because of money in the bank. So I get it. It's not the best, but that's what they did. All right. I think the big thing coming out of Monday Night Raw was the return of Rhea Ripley. Dominic Mysterio finally beats Ray Mysterio. And this was a, a dual tag team match where his tag partner was Liv. She was the one who got the match set up for them. Uh, Ray was tagging with Zelina Vega. In the end, uh, they come incredibly close to kissing. They, they are basically forehead to forehead and Dom's going in for it. And then Rhea Ripley makes her return. Now, internally, Rhea has been listed as a baby face. <laughs> Most people in Judgment Day are heels. I feel like Damian Priest at this moment in time is kind of a baby face as well. I don't really know what he is. Uh, but Rhea returns, and she did not look happy. How surprised were you that Rhea returned? And remember, 
Damien Priest throughout Monday night's show gave us little nuggets that Dominic Mysterio is going to have to answer for his actions. He's going to have to address and deal with the consequences of what he's done. It sounds like, and it seems like, Damian Priest, incredibly tired of Liv Morgan, whereas Finn Balor, uh, Carlito, um, and uh, J.D. McDonough are all cool with Liv because she helped them win titles and helped in matches. Uh, Dom seems cool with Liv because she just helped him beat Rey Mysterio. Damian Priest, not cool with Liv, calls in mommy and brings her back. And now, kind of through Dom underneath the bus, again, it seems like this group is breaking at the seams with the two leaders, the two so-called leaders, and Damian Priest and Rhea Ripley probably going their own way, and Finn Balor maybe taking this group over. What 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 was your thought? And, and like I said, how surprised were you that Rhea Ripley returned? Because I was kind of shocked that Rhea returned. Yeah, it was cool. It, you, you saw really when Damian Priest was on the phone, you knew what was coming. It, it, it's great because now we're going to start to get some conclusions, the furthering of the story with Liv Morgan. Um, I think people are really curious to see, um, <laughs> is Rhea going to slap up Dom? What's the consequence? You know, so it, it's going to be great. And it's just now when you have... This, the way in which the seeds have been planted with a long-term story with Liv, it's going to be great for Rhea to get her title back and she can resume her her career. It's going to be great because Liv Morgan now is going to get elevated. She's going to be in a main event type feud. And now you also have what's going to happen with the Judgment Day. I like your idea. I think Rhea and Damien should go off on their separate rays, uh, should go off and do their thing. And then uh, Finn Balor and JD McDonough can go about and, and handle business, maybe form a different style of group that can do some great things and uh it's exciting man like i said the the blessing is is that wwe has so many creative juices that they're telling more and more stories that are awesome and they're all intriguing and this one's going to be great you kind of know what's going to happen Rhea's going to whoop ass but i think it's one of those things where you can tell us what's going to happen and we're all going to be excited to see it yeah i agree with you i think this is going to be a lot of fun I don't know where we're going to go with it, but I am looking forward to it. And I do think what happens is Dom maybe kind of rebels against Rhea and says, no, I'm going with Liv. And Liv and Finn and JD all are kind of their own little group and, and Carlito as well. That's 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 your new judgment day. That's your judgment day 2.0 while Rhea and, and Damian Priest can go do their own things again. There's been a lot of things that have been building for a long time, and I think we're going to start to get some finality to it. Uh, so SummerSlam season is going to be a lot, a lot of interesting, cool things that are going to take place. Real fast. Do you think, uh, let's transition wait, 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 over to – Yeah, before AW, real fast. Do you think uh, – you, you planted a seed. Do you think Dom should reunite all the Latinos with his with Ray, with uh, the LWO, with the all the Latinos, and then and with Carlito, and then just join a huge Latino faction like the NWO. That's just like you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm uh, I, I let a distraction get in my way, and I'm gonna learn and, and meet my like more of an Eddie Guerrero style, like a little bit more aggressive. I think Dom kind of not being a gang leader, like you don't want to kind of do that, but like a tough individual like the Bloodline, but in a Latino kind of way. Do you think a, a, an eight, nine person Latino crew would work in 2024 led by Dom, Dom, Ray, I think uh, Carlito, uh, you have all the Latinos at the LWO. Uh, I think it would be great. I, I think it could. Um, I think too early. We'd have to get away from where we're at right now, though. It, not, yeah. it, it can't happen now, and it can't happen in the next two months. Okay. Uh, I think we've got to get further away from this Dom and Ray right. Right. story because they've been they've been at it for what feels like two years now. Um, so you got to put some distance, and you've got to kind of move that forward. You move that forward a little bit. Yeah, I think that could happen. I think Dom could show some of his. Uh, you have to realize too, Dom's been basically portrayed as a simp the entire time. You know <laughs> right. what I'm saying? Right. So like, you're going to have to show Dom building yeah. some, some confidence and some credibility. Once you do that, yes, I think you can, you could move into that. And I think, yeah, it could work. I would love to see this new cutting edge, uh, LWO type of, of faction. Not so much one that's ran by Ray's Ray's kind of feels like it's very nostalgic, I, I don't necessarily want that. Need something a little bit more current, uh, a little bit more edgy. I think it could work. 
Um, but it, it would, and, and look, if they did do it, I'm talking, I want like WCW cruiserweight yes. flippy type yes. shit yes. is what I want. Yes. I, I don't, I don't want these guys locking up arm bars. No, no, no. I want dudes springboarding off of everything. I want dudes like Hooventude coming in and doing weird shit. Uh, I want like, I want like <laughs> Lucha wrestling is no what doubt. I want. Yeah, no doubt. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I can't wait. This next couple of years, man. Woohoo. Could be really interesting. Uh, re- real quick, before we go into into AEW, I, I just have to ask this question. On Friday night, uh, Jacob Fatu came out like a savage animal and decimated Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, just completely annihilated the tag team champs after uh, their first title defense. Did this undermine them and devalue them, uh, basically getting taken out by one dude and just obliterated them? Like basically suck their souls and then threw their dead carcasses off to the side. I was kind of like, why would you do that to your tag team champs like that? Why would you, why would you put these guys out there, let them get a big win and then just kind of cut the legs out from underneath them. I, I did to me, it didn't make sense. No, yeah, what, what were your thoughts on Jacob Fatu taking out the tag team champs on Friday night? No, I think that you're just trying to, you know, look, uh, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, you know what they are. So I think that that's actually a perfect team to go and take out. Like Jacob Fatu is not messing around and he's going to target people that are important. He's going to target uh, individuals. And, and in the end, it's just kind of like that was the match that was going on. So he's coming in at any moment to wreck things. And Jacob Fatu, it's more about them. It's more about him. Than it is the tag. Look, the tag division is always going to be a little bit less than the main event type stuff. But in the end, Jacob Fatu is so far above anything. He can do whatever the hell he wants. He's a werewolf. He's believable. He's doing, I mean, he's doing flips off the rope. He, he looks like an MVP. He almost is at the point now, two weeks in, three weeks in, people are like, why isn't he the leader? <laughs> Jacob Fatu, money investment, money well spent. Most definitely. Uh, I just, again... You got championships on those dudes. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily make sense to me to take them out like that. But we'll see what happens. Again, it's always in the grander scheme of a, of a larger story. And on AEW, we had a new revelation in what has been a – it's about nine months long now. A nine-month story tell. We had a surprising heel turn as Mariah May bloodies Tony Storm. Was this the best heel turn in AEW? Was this I, to me? This was executed so perfectly. Mariah May comes in, kind of directionless. It felt like ends up siding with Tony Storm. Tony Storm takes her underneath her wing. There were times where Mar- Mariah May was wearing her ring gear was the basically the same thing that Tony Storm wore. Everything was done like Tony Storm. She gets into this into the Owen Hart classic for the women's. Gets the big win. She's now challenging Tony Storm at All In, and as they're going up the, the 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 ramp, she takes the the Owen Hart belt and she just bashes Tony Storm in the face and bloodies the shit out of her. At one point, she took her face and rubbed her face in Tony Storm's blood. It was crazy. It was sadistic. Luther got kicked in the balls and shoved off the ramp. To me, this was absolutely incredible. We just came off of a week of, of a week. On, on Dynamite, where we had two heel turns, one from MJF, one from Mercedes Monet. They were okay. This was great. I thought this was fantastic. In your estimation, has this been and was this the best long-term heel turn in AEW? No doubt about it. They did a great job, worthy of attention, and I think that Mariah May and Tony Storm are going to be um, – intriguing moving forward they have been the addition of the blood i thought added to the element of like whoa and mariah may being so vicious to tony storm it came out of the blue and it's really smart and it's a story that people can get involved in and something that people can pay attention to on the women's side i thought it was well executed kudos to aw for that's the biggest one of the easiest stories to tell is betrayal and now you're starting tell the story and and now you have to again to have success, to move things forward, you have to now, you have the story, now the matches have to conclude in a way that furthers the evolution of what you want to tell. If Mariah May goes over, if Tony Storm goes over, uh, most likely now getting revenge. It's great. I'm intrigued. I liked it. I thought it was A plus by AEW. It was absolutely fantastic in my estimation. Was there anything else from AEW that you wanted to talk about before we got into uh, uh, show of the week? Yeah, absolutely. I just think that I disagree. Look, it's great. 
MJF, Will Ospreay, putting it on free TV is stupid. I think that, look, if you don't learn from the past, you don't evolve as a wrestling company. I think one of the biggest mistakes WCW made was putting Goldberg and Hulk Hogan on free TV. Yeah, it drew a number, but you're leaving money on the table. And I guess we have to kind of stop thinking that Tony Khan cares about money. I mean, look, you want to pop a rating for a week. Look, your ratings are at 500,000. You've you're on a downward climb. Okay, let's just say one week you get 1.4. The next week you don't have enough based on ratings. And I know people will say, well, not a lot of people are watching nowadays. There's different metrics that you can show. Um, I look at it like wrestling is a business. And at some point you recognize MJF and Will Ospreay, that is worthy of a story other than two weeks of shit talking, stare down. Um, I thought Will Ospreay's promo fell just slight of perfect in regards to the flub that he made talking about MJF in the battle of 2024. I thought that it was good to have MJF in the background this week. He's a heel, clearly. We all want to see it. I just think giving it away on free TV is crazy. I just think that it's a pay-per-view match. You could build it up for the first time. You could even build it up over months. Uh, I mean, what this one was easy. Will Ospreay is doing his thing, and MJF just costs him matches. Simple. He shows up. Uh, You know, or clearly, you know, uh, what would bother. Uh, Will Osprey, you find that out. You dig deeper. You do more of a of a of a of a story for this main event situation. Instead, they're just like, well, we have two big stars. We all know you want to see it, so I'll just give it to you. I mean, yeah, but at the same time, I think you're you're being lazy in regards to building something that could be really special and really great. So I, I'm gonna watch it, and I'm, I'm sure it, it might be the first of many matches. But AEW clearly, on some level, is just Tony Khan going. I think the people like these matches, so I'll put it on. Well, your ratings are at 500K. I mean, maybe you have a deal locked in place, but at the same token, I feel like you could double your ratings if you told, if you started to just consistently tell stories, have some buildup, have some intrigue to the level of getting me fever pitched to find a way to see this match. But I hope it delivers. I think it has a real good chance to do that. But I just think that giving that away on free TV is putting money that you could have charged up in a big stadium. You're just lighting that on fire and putting it on free TV. And it might even be in a venue that has less than 10,000 people in it. So, and in the end, I guess we all just have to recognize that in the end, Tony Khan already has a billion dollars. He has money coming in. This could be even on a bigger level, just a write-off, a big, huge write-off for his dad's conglomerate where, hey, uh, Tony, good job. You make a hundred million. You 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 make a hundred million. You spend a hundred twenty. We lose twenty million in the big grand scheme of things. We can write that off in our portfolio uh, because we're, we have billion dollars coming in from the NFL. Because the NFL, uh, I was reading, they could get fined each team four hundred million dollars, but in one revenue check they got from twenty twenty two, they made four hundred million. In one year, every team got a, is going to get a check for four hundred million. So you look at it, and this could be a grand scheme. Like, Tony Khan doesn't have to make money. He doesn't work. I mean, literally, the thesis of AEW could be literally forever. Hey, I like this match. I'm going to put it on there. He doesn't maybe doesn't ever have to worry about money because he's got it coming in from soccer. He's got it coming in from football. He's doing it in tech. So AEW maybe necessarily never has to technically make money. But for someone that's in business, you realize, okay, I feel like you left a couple hundred grand on the table by advertising this for free. So, hey, let's see what happens. I I, I think that Will Ospreay and MJF is main event status. It's like a WrestleMania main event. So we'll see what happens from it. Yeah, I look, I agree with you 100%. I don't know why you would put this on free TV. But <laughs> what the fuck? Look, Tony's still trying to negotiate a TV deal and trying to get TV rights. So I think that has a bit to do with it. But same deal, man. I don't know why the hell you would do that. It just doesn't make any sense well, to me. Well, because have, um, have you heard that AEW's talent roster costs $105 million? You just signed Mercedes Monet to $10 million. He doesn't seem yeah, like he's operating like somebody that is losing money. He doesn't operate for sure. like somebody that cares that he's losing money. I mean, you get, you know, you get ratings at 500000 and it's been on a decline, and you still keep doing the same things. Yeah, you're starting to tell some stories. But you got a bloated roster. You trimmed it a little bit, but at the same token, you've lost the the negativity. You lost Ethan Page. He becomes a champion right away. You're getting negative stories now from Ethan saying that AEW is a complete disorganized mess. 
And it sounds yep. like what and it's not the first story like that to come out either. Yeah. So it's it's wild to think, but this is the first time where a billionaire, uh, you know, Ted Turner, but his situation was he sold he sold WCW and he he got mm-hmm. out from under it. Tony Khan seems like he could do this thing forever, and he's that crazy and that rich, like I said, that it doesn't it seems like maybe we gotta put aside the worrying about ratings and money because the guy simply doesn't care about it. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think, because sometimes I just feel like he's a, Tony Khan is a guy who just kind of, he's a wrestling fan, right? Like we've talked about the sport. He is a wrestling fan. That's what made him want to get in this business. He doesn't have to do this. This guy can go do anything he wants to do, but this is what he wants to do. This is his, this is whether it's his hobby or whether it's his passion or whatever, whatever you want to call it. This is what he wants to do. I don't think he necessarily makes wise investments, the the Mercedes Monet, I think, is is a a a perfect encapsulation of of just kind of throwing good money after bad. I don't think she's worth ten million dollars. No, I don't think she's brought in nearly the ratings that they thought she was going to bring in. I don't nope. think she's brought in nearly the houses that they thought she was going to bring in. Nope. I don't think she's been very entertaining as far as a character goes. Now maybe right. this all figures itself out. But so far, you got to remember, too, we waited almost three months. He signed her three months early, and she just basically sat on a shelf. And then he broke her out, and it was kind of like it, – it was like going to, like, a little kid's birthday party and them having the little the little, uh, little noisemakers and little things where you pull it, and it just kind of pops, and there's, like, a little bit of some streamers that come out with some confetti. It was like one of those. It was like, poo, and you're like, all right, cool. This is what it is. And it's really not not ever really gotten correct better than that. Like that was the highest level. So far, this has been horrible. So it, it'll be interesting. Maybe Britt Baker can bring something out of her. Maybe it gets better. But as of right now, I feel like he's just a guy who has a hard time maybe addressing and finding talent and then developing the talent because. Mercedes Monet is not somebody I would have gave ten million dollars to. I'd have told her like, okay, we'll go back to WWE. Like you're a big name, but like, she doesn't have. To me, she seems like a one dimensional character. It's it's like her. It's 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 heel Sasha Banks and it's heel Sasha Banks. Well, and that's what she is. Well, because she she had leverage. Um, the reason why she commanded ten million was she could say, I don't really need to do this. I could be a movie star. So. You know, I'm sure Tony just went right to, okay, what's it going to take? And her representative said for her to kind of put aside movies, put aside and make more of a commitment, uh, you let her do what she wants, but she needs 10 million. He's like, okay. So, cause it's one of those things where he doesn't need value. Like he just wants her in the company. And that's what we're saying is that you and I are thinking of it like how we would think about it. I think for Tony Khan, he's like, I like Sasha. I like her in my company. How much does it cost? 10 million. I got that. No problem. Cause a hundred million dollar talent rosters is pretty bloated. And it doesn't matter. That's what I'm saying. The whole thesis is it does not, he doesn't care about value. He's like, I like Drew McIntyre. I'll make him a $10 million offer. I like Sami Zayn. I'll make him a $15 million offer. I like AJ Styles. You're just, it, there's no value to it because he's not looking at it like that. He's looking at it like, what's it going to take to get X person I want in my company and I can go get it. And that's the, the, the advantage maybe that he has of not worrying about even ever re- getting return on investment. He doesn't care because he's got five other companies that make him money. That's the crazy part is that you and I have a hard time wrapping our mind around running something that just loses money. But like I said, we never commanded something that got 100 million in the bank. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. it's 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 just a different mindset because you and I would panic and be like, "We lost 20 million this year." But yeah, you made 100, <laughs> but but you know, you you started with some, you know, and, and it's just it's one of those deals where we have to wrap our mind of you have a billionaire who can have a lot of money coming in from somewhere else other than AEW. So making money in ratings is maybe, we just got to assess how the company runs based on our opinion, the matches and the stories, but making money ratings, maybe just something we just have to put on the shelf because he doesn't have to care. It would appear. It doesn't, you're not hearing talks of bankruptcy. You're not hearing talks of getting thrown off a of television. You're not hearing mass exodus of contracts. You're, you're seeing some, you know, developmental stars going over to WWE, but you're not getting uh, the Daniel Bryan's going back, the Moxie's going back. Uh, you know, you, you still have value to have a company that runs that doesn't do house shows. That's the crazy part is they're not touring. <laughs> so it's a company that has their, the- their thesis and they're operating on it. So I think we have to change. And that's, I think, what's going to happen with me. I just, 
hey, okay, they don't they they lose money, but he doesn't have to care. It's 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 wild to be able to be able to do it. Yeah, you're right. It's 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 a completely different business model than I think anything that we're used to. And I think some of the stuff that we see, like you said, they don't do live shows. Live shows are basically where you get to go and you get to try different stories, you get to try different moves, you get to try different stuff out. They don't do that. So it, it's just it's just different. It's it, to me, we just have to kind of look at it as the the most high end indie company you've ever seen and that's just how it kind of runs and it is what it is and it'll be what it'll be um we just have to just kind of adjust the way we think about it this week what was your show of the week honorable mention to nxt joe hendry continuing to grow his brand good on you man good on you mate but the show of the week was raw with the return of rhea ripley yep for sure i agree with you 110 percent uh you want some news and notes hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes what made your list A new ESPN guy will be in the booth for WWE. On Tuesday, WWE announced that ESPN announcer Joe Tessitore will be added to the announcer booth. Tessitore will head up a three-man booth with color commentator Corey Graves and Wade Barrett for WWE's SmackDown. Graves is expected to revert back to his role as color commentator after taking over the lead play-by-play role for SmackDown matches after Kevin Patrick was let go by WWE earlier this year. Finn Balor sits down and spills the beans on the demon and his new WWE contract. Speaking on the What's the Story podcast, Balor confirmed that his new WWE contract is for five years and why we won't be seeing the demon for a while. Admitting that he wasn't a fan of the execution of the most recent few demon appearances, Balor said, I would like to keep Finn as a heel and the demon as a babyface and not blur the lines at all. But it's so hard, and I feel like the demon's kind of something that we haven't executed very well the last couple of years, and I'd rather not do it then, do it in a way that I'm not happy with. So, And look, in six years' time, they can throw me out there in the demon paint, and I'll do the entrance. But now, Finn's just having too much fun, and it feels like I can give a lot more layers as a heel Finn than the demon. The demon's just very straightforward. He's like a bulldozer. He just goes straight for the kill whereas Finn's a little bit more sneaky, and there's more story arc you can tell with Finn versus a supernatural demon. So the last time we saw the demon was in Hell in the Cells match against Edge at WrestleMania 39 in 2023. A recent CMLL and New Japan pro wrestler who appeared on AEW has abruptly signed with the competition. CMLL and New Japan star Stephanie Van Coor who recently competed in AEW, is headed to WWE with a number of companies being upset over her deal. Uh, Vancouver's move to WWE was revealed in a special announcement from CMLL and New Japan, with Shawn Michaels going on to tweet, Welcome to the WWE family, at Stephanie underscore Vancouver. We'll see you in Orlando. With the early reporting noting that Vancouver had significant time left on her CMLL deal, Dave Meltzer has provided detail on the reaction on Wrestling Observer Radio, stating... When she told when she had told them CMLL, they basically asked her and said, you know, we won't stand in your way or anything like that. If you want to go, you can go, but just do business the right way. She got the tag titles in CMLL. She got the singles title and was basically to go to San Jose where she had been advertised for months and drop the title there, drop the tag title, dual farewell. And the feeling was that they expected that of her and basically told her, look, They want you, and they may not want you to do that. But you haven't signed yet, so you can just tell them, I want to go out the right way. Then on Monday, when she signed, she told them that Tuesday, which was last night in Guadalajara, when her last night, and she wouldn't be coming to Arena Mexico on Friday. She wouldn't do any of the dates. She's got dates all over the world. She had dates in Germany. She had the the, the Copper Box date on August 24th, other New Japan Strong dates, and things like that. That had been agreed to. Meltzer continued, CMLL was very upset with her and, you know, because of what happened. And also they had never been targeted by WWE this way. People are expecting that she'll be announced at the Mexico City Arena CDMX show on Saturday, July 13th, which is probably where why they were so adamant about her not going to San Jose on Saturday, July 13th. New Japan was very upset because when they first announced that show in San Jose, she was the first batch of people announced and they had been advertising for months. It's kind of like their basic thing. You've been advertised for months for the show in a championship match. And then five days before the show, you pull out 
and you're doing the champion and you're the champion. AEW wasn't happy because they didn't want her uh, because they wanted her and they made her an offer to her, but she went with WWE and it's not a surprise because she grew up in Chile. And when she grew up wanting to be a wrestler, there was no such thing as AEW. Her wrestling predates AEW by years. And she did have a WWE tryout before she got good and they didn't sign her then. That's the place she wants to go, but how it happened was not well received. That court lost the and New, J- New Japan Strong uh, Women's Championship in her winner take all match at AEW's Forbidden Door uh, against TBS champion Mercedes Monet. That was back on June 30th of 2024. So she ruffled a lot of feathers by not doing business the right way and just kind of rolling out and going with WWE. This happened very quick. Like these reports came out middle of the day on Monday, and by Tuesday morning, she was already, it was being reported that she had already signed with WWE and all of her dates had been pulled. Uh, so kind of crazy how, how it all just happened just kind of overnight. It was nuts. Uh, AEW uh, is having more roster changes. Recently, CJ Perry, AKA Lana has announced her contract expired with AEW and another report is being re- announced that Ric Flair's woo energy drink sponsorship with AEW is over and that, is a sign that Ric Flair's time with AEW is up as well. So no Ric Flair, no CJ Perry uh, in AEW. We'll be seeing what happens with them. Uh, CJ Perry has come out and said that she'd like to get into a more of a managerial role, not so much worrying about wrestling um, because she's better at the managing part of it, being the valet. So we'll see what takes place there and uh, see where she pops up. But that's going to do it for this week's wrestling news and notes. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. If you've agreed or disagreed with anything we said today on this week's episode, hit us up. Let us know what you think. Man, good week of wrestling. Good recap. I can't wait for next week to be able to record the latest and greatest episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. Thank you for listening to this week's episode.